Well, first of all, thank you all so much for um, letting me be here tonight. I'm so excited. I'm, I feel like there's a lot of people in the room that I know through Facebook. I almost feel like I know you so well through Facebook, but if I don't know your name, come and, come and introduce yourself to me. Um, thank you for the Melanoma Research Foundation for Cure OM, um, for the Selig's, both Becky and Sarah and Lauren, and all the work that's been done. It's just so fun to meet all of you and to be here tonight. Um, a little bit on the front end, it's kind of strange being from Auburn and being in the state of North Carolina because I have to say a really loud war damn eagle because uh, we um, are in the final four. If you don't believe that miracles can happen, um, I'm here to tell you that they do. If you are not a basketball fan, um, you need to come spend some time with me and Dr. Cam tomorrow night as we watch the game somewhere together because it's kind of a big deal. And if you see one of the trees out front rolled with toilet paper tomorrow night or Sunday morning, that indicates that we won. So... <laughs> Just want to educate you on another thing about Auburn. We are the Auburn Tigers. We are not the Auburn War Eagles. We shout War Eagle. So if you hear us saying War Eagle really loud, it's just because we're very excited about our basketball team. <laughs> um, having said that, um, I want to share with you tonight my story. And um, I'm hoping so much so that um, a lot of y'all I know will be able to identify with this. But part of my hope, too, is that you'll leave with some hope and encouragement regardless of where you are. Um, this is my family. Um, I've been married to my high school sweetheart for 27 years now, as of two weeks ago. We got married when I was 10. And um, <laughs> this is him in this picture. And uh, we have four great kids. My oldest went to the University of Memphis, um, played football there. I have a son that's a junior at Auburn, a daughter that will be a sophomore at Auburn next year, but it's at Troy this year. And then my sweet surprise at the end is my little Ben, who's 14. And um, we call him the sweet surprise, not the accident, because he is absolutely delightful. But my journey, I'm gonna tell you a little backstory and hopefully get through it quickly, because um, it actually starts from high school. And I'm sure some of y'all are gonna be like, what does that have to do with anything? But I'm gonna tie this up neatly in the very end. When I was in high school, Dave and I, dated. I met him when I was 14. He was 16. His friends were a year older than him, and there was this cute, cute, cute girl that was a year older than him that kind of had an, an interest in him that I wasn't really crazy about. So needless to say, she was not my favorite person in high school. Um, we had very choice words for her in my household. Um, her name is Jill, okay? So fast forward a few years, and um, after Jill went off to college, and then later Dave and I went off to school, and we all graduated, I moved to Greenville, South Carolina for a year. Y'all need to meet some people at my table who are also from Greenville. But anyway, um, lived in Greenville, South Carolina for a year, and then moved to, all, I mean, moved to Birmingham, where lo and behold, my husband and Jill's husband um, played on the same softball team. We became good friends, ironically. Um, we all had children around the same time. My best friend ended up living next door to her, and to make a long story short, as the Lord would have it, he redeemed that relationship, and we became very, very good friends. In 2012, we were such good friends, we travel with them every year. We have, they have four kids, like I said, we have four kids, and we were at the beach together um, in 2012, and next thing I know, Jill is asking me, um, what is that black spot on your eye? This is a picture of my eye. Um, actually, it was a screenshot that I took of what the doctor took. So you can see that there were some tendrils that were kind of circled, but you can see the black tumor, literally, at the bottom of my iris. And I remember when Jill said, what is that black spot on your eye? And I went and looked in the mirror, and I was like, sure enough, I, that's a black spot on my eye. Showed it to my husband. Y'all, my nickname for my husband is Sweet Eyes. It's been Sweet Eyes since we dated in high school. And um, I tell you that part because I had just spent two weeks with my family. I have three sisters. Um, for Mother's Day in May, we had, we had all gotten together. I worked at a hospital where I was around doctors every single day. Um, so it doesn't fall flat on me that God would choose Jill to be the one to tell me. It was just an, an unusual thing that she was the one to say, hey, what about the spot on your eye? Okay, embarrassingly, at that time, well, a little another quick backstory. When Dave and I got married, he was a teacher, taught at JL Mann in Greenville, South Carolina, and then um, at Hoover High School in Birmingham. Um, and we were having children left and right, and it just became increasingly difficult to feed our family. And so he um, decided to start selling drugs. And so he did. He sold drugs. That would be pharmaceutical drugs, okay? <laughs> he sold Nexium for a while. He did really, really well with that to the point that um, he became a specialty rep where he was selling oncology products for breast cancer. And it took us to Memphis, Tennessee. <clears throat> when we were in Memphis, 
He's the type person, um, absolutely delightful man. He's always going to do the right thing if nobody's watching. And he would go above and beyond. And he gained some recognition from some oncologists there whose practice was splitting. They were looking for an administrator. And they asked him to be their administrator. If y'all know anything about that, that's not how you become an administrator. You typically have a master's degree and, and that and whatnot. So anyway, um, I'm going to tell you why that's important in a minute. So I come back from the beach. Jill brings out this spot on my eye. And um, I'm not a worrier. I'm not an anxious personality. I did absolutely nothing, y'all. I mean, I Googled change in iris color, but nothing crazy came up, so I didn't do anything about it. Okay. In our family, when it's your birthday, we um, celebrate by going out to eat someplace special, typically hibachi, and, um, which is an Auburn thing as well. Having said that, um, Jer uh, Caroline's birthday is June 23rd, and her best friend's birthday is same day. So her best friend was having to spend the night party. Caroline is not with us, and we get invited to go eat dinner with this group of oncologists that Dave works with. I tell you that part of the story because normally we would not have been there. We would have declined the offer because of Caroline's birthday, but that's not what happened. I ended up getting invited to this party. While we're there, one of the wives says to me, what is that spot on your eye? You need to have my husband look at it. So I'm at this dinner with all these oncologists, and the guy said, sure enough, Ashley, you don't need to wait. You need to go have that looked at Monday. Okay, if you've ever tried to be a new patient somewhere, do you ever get in the same day? You never do. So of course I called, and it was going to be three weeks. So I go about my day not really worried about anything, heading to Target, and lo and behold, there's a Vision Works on the corner next to Target with this big sign that says, free eye exam. <laughs> so I go in. I go in on my way to Target thinking, well, they just said to go get your eyes tested, and I meet this cute, very pregnant, about to bust. We hit it off. We're talking, all these pleasantries, talking about how I have four kids. She does the whole eye exam, and I haven't stopped running my mouth. If she gets to the end of it, tells me what kind of glasses to get. And I was like, so that's it? She said, yeah, that's it. And they'll help you pick out, you know, you can get them. They'll be ready this afternoon, whatever. And I was like, well, what about this, like, spot on my eye? And she goes, oh, you do have a spot on your eye. So, y'all, part of my story, literally, not to throw her under the bus because I know that there's a reason she's in my story, um, but I, I'm one of those who I'm like, well, you need a dilated eye exam because she literally went through her old whole exam and then gave me the buy one, get one free spill. You know, but that's, that's what that vision works is for. Having said that, though, once she saw that, she said, let me make a phone call, and I had an appointment on Thursday. So sure enough, I go in to go see Dr. Matthews in, in Memphis, and he does the great test. This is where this picture actually came from. And um, at the end, of, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there waiting for him to come in and talk to me, and I have this cute little resident come in, sitting really close, and he looks at my eyes and he says, you know what, I'm going to, I think I'm going to go get the doctor. <laughs> I'll be right back. So sure enough, he goes and he gets um, Dr. Matthews who says, I'm going to go get my partner. And then the partner comes in and he says, if you'll wait just a minute, we want to get some people to come in. And next thing I know, there are eight residents and doctors standing in the room, one at a time sitting down. I'm, I'm just going with the flow. And I finally said, you know what, I'm starting to feel like the interesting case and I, I'm pretty sure it's not good to be the interesting case. So what's going on? <clears throat> and Dr. Matthews kind of nonchalantly takes out a yellow sticky note and writes on there, iris melanoma, and hands it to me. He says, we believe you have an iris melanoma. Do you know what melanoma is? And I said, yeah, I know, I know what melanoma is. Is this anything I should worry about? He said, typically we just measure it, but just to be safe, um, we're going to send you to an ocular oncologist. So I went to Dr. Matt Wilson. Anybody else go to Dr. Wilson in here? Just curious. Okay, well, he's in Memphis. Um, many of you know Memphis has St. Jude Hospital. And so, um, sadly, the reason this man is so well-versed in what he does is because he treats so many children with retinoblastoma. He's an ocular oncologist there. So I go see Dr. Wilson on the following Monday. Dave, of course, is with me. They do all these tests, and I'll never forget, they're doing... Um, this ultrasound on my eye. Anybody have an ultrasound on your eye? It's like the coolest but craziest experience because you can see what they're doing. It's crazy. And while they're doing that, Dr. Wilson comes in. He says, I want you to measure the depth of this. And he's telling the little tech guy, I need you to measure this. And don't forget, you know, I know it's from 12 o'clock to 9 o'clock. And he's using, you know, all this. And he leaves and the tech says, wow, this must be serious because he never comes in here. And that's kind of when my heart sank and I knew, okay, yeah, I'm not in Kansas anymore. So we go in, and of course, Dr. Wilson comes in, and he's a wee little man, and um, with very choice words, not all of which I can say here today. 
He said, this is not an iris melanoma. I've got some pretty blank news for you. Um, this is a very bad type of cancer to have. This is a ciliary body melanoma, um, and it's large, and I think you need to have your eye removed. And so within 15 seconds, you know, my life changed just right then. And I'm one of those people, I, I can remember standing up, you know, kind of leaning against the wall, and Dave being like, have her eye removed. Like, should we get like a second opinion or something? And, and y'all, there is no good way to tell a person they have cancer. There, there's really not. And it, honestly, he's, he's in my phone. I could call that man at any time, and he would pick it up right then and talk to me. Um, so I'm not saying that was a bad way. I'm just saying for me, that was a hard way to hear it. And I was one of those people growing up, y'all, if you were to meet my dad, the most pleasant man in the world, he's got these beautiful, big, green eyes, eyelashes that should not be on a man. And all my life, all I heard was, you have your daddy's eyes. And it was one thing that personally, I felt really good about myself because my eyes, sorry. And I kept thinking, you know, why not my pinky toe or something? I mean, just remove, like, that mole on my back. I wish I could get rid of. But um, I ended up getting a second opinion. I saw Dr. Grosnikos in Emory. Um, was told about going to Philadelphia, but financially it was just easier for me to go to Atlanta. We have family there. And he said, yes, Ashley, you need to, you need to have your eye removed. So I am one of those who had my right eye enucleated. Um, and this is me. <laughs> Uh, the life after enucleation is what I call it. Um, ah, there you go. Uh, sorry not to, I know people are still eating, but some of you have seen this before, so you know what this is like. But um, I was 42 years old. My youngest child was in first grade, had a son that was being highly recruited, very, very active life in high school. And, um, and it was the fall, you know, it was just a crazy time. My eye was removed August 16th of 2012. Um, I was sent off for testing, and it did come back as a class 2 tumor. And at the time, I didn't really understand that completely. Um, I just knew that my surveillance was one that, you know, I had it every four months. My scans are next week. But I'm standing before you seven years later um, with no Mets. And I'm really excited to say that and pray that I'll be part of that little percentage um, that never has any is what my hope is. And so I, I really am encouraged by all of you who are doing research because I believe we're going to see a difference in my lifetime, and I hope it, it, it makes my lifetime go longer <laughs> than expected. Um, having said that, <clears throat> this was kind of me. I'm, I'm one of those, I don't know if any of you have read the book, there's five love languages. Um, there's actually a sixth love language. I say it's monogramming. It's a very southern thing. <laughs> and so I have patches with my monograms kind of blinged on it and stuff. Um, I did it again. Okay, there we are. Um, and y'all, this is my cute ocularist. He kind of looks like Captain Kangaroo. I absolutely love this man. His name is Bob Thomas, and he is an ocularist in Memphis, Tennessee, and he's so sweet. When you sit down with him at the beginning of that eight-hour day, if any of you have had a prosthetic eye made, he, he, hand, he does it by hand. And so I know some people have cool technology now, but he says, you know what I get to do today, Ashley? I get to um, copy with the God of the universe put in your body. I get to hand paint it to look just like what he created. And he spent the whole day, it was just such a sweet thing. And then my cute husband, I keep talking about how cute he is. This is my house. We had this holly tree. Okay, he, he leaves for a couple of hours before I get my new eye and he puts this eye around this holly tree. Isn't that clever? And this, you know, Ashley's cancer-free new eye day. And y'all, the people in the community came by. I had like 200 signatures on my little sign just wishing me the best, which I thought was pretty neat. So that's me and given. And, you know, for those of you who um, have to wear a patch or um, had a patch that for a while, you know, for six weeks I had this patch. And some people, they have to go a lot longer than that because of swelling and other issues or, or a prosthetic eye isn't an option for them. Wearing a patch sometimes can be really hard. I can remember being in the grocery store and hearing the child say, why does that, why does that lady look like a pirate? And I just remember... I call it the gift of normalcy because I can remember going, I can't wait to get out in public and nobody look at me. You know, like nobody turn around. And, um, and mine, I always say, you know, my, my, my prosthetic eye, my fake eye is like pretty all the time. It's white and pretty all the time. I realize like red and tired. The skin is nice over here. I kind of need a lift on this side. So I kind of like my prosthetic eye. Um, and, and I got to tell you, to get through this, you know, we do have kind of this gift of normalcy kind of thing, but we had, in my family, 
um, the gift of levity, is what I call it. Um, I, again, just having the four kids, every now and then I'll look at them and I'll go, okay, I've got my eye on you. And I get to <laughs> use that finger. I've had one who never gives me any trouble, but he got in some trouble and actually took my eye out, put it next to his bed and said, <laughs> got my eye on you, you know? Because, you know, you have to, I worked in a hospital. <laughs> so bad, so bad. Um, I worked in a hospital at the time, and, um, you know, when you first get your eye, sometimes it, it waters a lot. And um, I remember being told that you need to kind of wipe toward the middle, but evidently I wiped a lot this direction um, the day that this was happening. One of my first days back, and I'm, I feel really cute. I'm wearing my cutest clothes, got my cutest hair done, all my makeup, feeling like I'm looking great. And I go walking down the hall, and this doctor passes me, and he says, I, I don't know your name, but I know your story, and you need to go fix this. And sure enough, it's like, Lord, looking over here. I have no idea how long that had been happening. Um, but then I will tell you, even seven years later, um, it's still hard. You know, I'm not going to jokingly say this is not. Every day, there's something comes up that I go, well, I, I just had that daily reminder. Um, I was telling, tell, tell me your name again, it's Natalie, Natalie from, from Canada. Um, we rode from the airport here, um, just in the little bus or whatever, and I said, you know, I feel so accomplished when I can navigate um, the Atlanta airport. I mean, you feel accomplished anyway, but to do it with one eye is actually, like, I, I'm just like, Woo, I did it, you know, because... I, I do want to every now and then yell at people going, I know you see me. I may not see you, but why are you bumping into me? You know? <laughs> or um, like today, I, I turned very quickly, and when I turned, there was a lady right there, and I bumped into her with her coffee, and she was like, what the hell? And I was like, oh, sorry. I, you know, I, um, I have those moments that my heart hurts every day. Um, I'm one of those that um, I'm in sales and marketing, and I had my first day out in my sales job, and again, I'm wearing my cutest clothes, feeling like I'm the cutest person. And I get out, I don't, you know what I mean, but I get out of my car and this 26, 27-year-old hunk of a guy, pharmaceutical rep, gets out at the same time. We're walking into this doctor. I call on doctors. And I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm going to get in before him because I, I want to make sure I get in front of her before he does. God knows how long he'll be. And I fall right in front of him because the whole depth perception thing, like there was a step there, didn't see it. And anyway, it was one of those you know, keeps you humble kind of moments, I guess. Um, and then my most recent big thing was um, I, I'm severely anemic all the time, so I crave ice. And the best ice in the world is that little rabbit pill of Sonic ice. Thank you. So I go pulling into Sonic um, in my 2006 white minivan with the monogram on the back. And, um, and when I do, I hear this screech. And I'm hoping it's my mirror on that side, but no, if you've ever pulled in one of those stalls, like, why do they put the menus like that? I don't know. Anyway, and I look, and the menu is in my car. <laughs> like, literally, it was scraped all the way down. I have a hole in the side of my car. I had to call my husband, who works at the hospital. My son was in town from Memphis. They literally, because, like, the, the people from Sonic came out, they could have, they had, would have had to weld it out. So my husband and my son are bouncing my car off of the menu, <laughs> And I still have that car today because I don't have the courage, like, to buy a new car. I think I'm going to just mess it up. So if anybody wants to contribute to the Ashley Car Fund, you just let me know. But anyway, having said that, I will tell you there's one part of, though, my story that's probably different than anybody else's story who's been through that. And that is as soon as I found out and went home, I had two people I knew that I was able to call on. Matter of fact, I can, t I can remember telling Dr. Grossenklaus, everybody calls him Dr. G., um, in, in memory, I said, you know, what's crazy about this is I have two friends who went to Auburn with me who had this cancer. And he was like, that's impossible. I was like, no, no, it's really not. <laughs> I talked to them on the way here. They both have had their eye enucleated. And that's um, these two girls here. Allison Allred is in the middle, and Julie is the one who's on the right side. Julie and I were sorority sisters at Auburn, lived in the same dorm. Um, our, she's a year younger than me, so she came a year after me and then lived in the same, in Auburn, we don't have sorority houses, we have um, dorms, so we lived in the same dorm on the hill. Allison um, lived in the dorm right next to us, and then perpendicular to us, um, she was in a different sorority. But um, I knew both of them. Julie's one of those who found out while she was pregnant that she had a tumor and had her eye removed when her baby was six weeks old. Allison was diagnosed in 2001. If y'all follow our story, y'all know that she's been battling this for 18 years. Um, Sadly, got really bad news this week. I mean, she's had it in over 20 places in her body, um, her brain recently, spine, 
you know, uterus, breast, uh, kidney, you name it, and it's in her colon now causing obstruction, and they sent her home yesterday with no options, so we are still praying for her, but praying miracles because I still believe they happen, um, and if you ever get to talk with her, you're the luckiest person in the world because she's the most delightful, most positive person you'll ever meet. Um, Julie's case, she hadn't had meds for ocular melanoma, but six years ago had pancreatic cancer. I mean, how bizarre is that? It was like wave the white flag for her. Um, but these two ladies really helped me. And a lot of you go through this and you're absolutely alone. And I didn't have that experience. Um, I want to back up for just a second. So fast forward a little bit. Dave and I, our, our third, our junior and college son, when he was a junior in high school, decided he wanted to go to Auburn. And out-of-state tuition was out of the question for us. So we decided to move to Auburn. And after being there um, for a year, he gets into school and whatnot. But I get an, a Facebook message from Mark McLeam's family. And this is Mark McLeams, and y'all, after I was diagnosed, um, I don't know if Dr. Orloff is still in here, I think she probably left, but, um, oh, hi. <laughs> so um, we get, um, I'm contacted by somebody in her office and with Dr. Sato, um, just asking if they can kind of follow our cases. There were two other men, I think, who were being treated kind of at that time. Um, I'm not even sure of that kind of timeline or whatever, but they knew that there were two men and three women who were at Auburn roughly at the same time. Mark and I were the same age. He was in architecture school. We did not know each other. But anyway, fast forward, and I live in Auburn. I'm there for almost a year, and I get a call or a Facebook message from a friend of Mark McWilliams saying that he had passed away. And um, would we do like a, what he called a Facebook blitz to see if there anybody else who went to Auburn who had this cancer. So I tell people that because um, I say it in every interview that I've ever been in, and it's never shared. But the reason that we are doing everything we're doing is because of Mark McWilliams. And I, I want people to know that and his family to know we do everything we do to honor him and his memory. But moving forward, we, we did. The three of us shared a post on Facebook, that picture of my eye. And, you know, if you share something on Facebook and somebody shares it and you get six shares, that's kind of a big deal. This was shared over 2,500 times. And over the course of a year, we found out that there were 24 people. Um, we get a call from... Dr. Brennan and Dr. Orloff and Dr. Sato and their team that were doing some research in Huntersville. Um, are the Huntersville people here? Sue or Hello. Hello. I'm so glad y'all are here. So we were following what all was going on in Huntersville, and they said, you know, we're trying to kind of wrap that up um, at this first kind of part of the research. We'd like to come to Auburn and, and um, just have an open forum conversation. And so I'll tell you, um, while we were kind of planning this, the girl on the far end, Lori, was being treated in Philadelphia. And we had a group of people, some just local um, reporters that wanted to go up and meet with Dr. Orloff. And while they were there, Lori was being treated. So they said, well, hey, we'd like to interview her. Would she do it? And she said yes. And of course, after that, they came back. We get this call that um, Mike and so it's Mike and Dr. Orloff and John Castles. Shits, I'd never say his name right, but that's Dr. Sato's son, if y'all don't know him. And of course, most of y'all know Dr. Sato. Um, I love their Auburn shirts. They came down to Auburn and did a great little forum and introduced themselves to everybody. We had people from the university come. About 20 of the 24 um, patients at that time came that they got to interview and start a dialogue with. And um, following that, uh, it, we really got the momentum to, to start some research at Auburn. So I was asked to start this Facebook page. I started this Facebook page naively thinking that I was going to be interacting with about 24 to 36 people. And next thing I know, I get um, a phone call from a girl named Nicole, who one of her best friends had just been diagnosed in Sweden. And she was doing research um, and came across our Facebook page. Uh, she was a producer for the CBS This Morning show. And she asked if they could come to Auburn and do a story on us. But she had a lot to learn. So she came down and spent a day and a half with us. Um, she and her team. And if y'all followed our story, you know that in spring of 2018, we were on the CBS This Morning show. It was probably the best interview that was done. Definitely the people who spent the most time with us. But y'all, we were so green, so naive, so um, I wish I could have reached out to somebody who knew what was going on because where they did a great job, all of a sudden, it, it, just, it just happened. This national attention was just kind of crazy. I was literally driving around in Auburn the next day, going from office to office, and I get a call from the Today Show. 
that said, hey, we want to meet with y'all today. We want to do an interview today. I need all four of y'all together. I was like, well, I live in Auburn, and two of the girls are in Birmingham. It's two hours away, and Lori lives in Huntsville, and he was like, I'll have a car at your house in one hour, and we'll drive you to Birmingham. We, we want an interview today. They call that a swoop and scoop. I didn't know that, but that's a negative thing. <laughs> And um, did, CBS did not like that this happened, but, but we didn't know any better, and we thought, great, this is national attention, this will be super. So incidentally, Lori was going to see Dr. Mason, an ocular oncologist that y'all get to meet tomorrow. She was going to be in Birmingham. So I was the only one that was a problem, so I go, and this driver comes and picks me up and takes me to Birmingham. And next thing I know, we sit down for this 15-minute interview, and it was on the NBC Nightly News that night. And... Um, no research on their part. I'm not saying I don't appreciate the Today Show. It was just very different than what CBS had done the day before. So we're on CBS Nightly News. Um, a lot of kind of uh, swirling questions, a lot of uh, fingers pointing at the university. You can imagine that didn't go very well. Uh, living in that town and having that happen um, because a lot of things that were misconceptions. You know, people were starting to say, you know, y'all live together? So the three of y'all were roommates? And um, what about all these girls? Nobody ever talks about the guys. And y'all, now there's 51 people. Over half of them are men. But nobody seems to talk about that. But anyway, um, but at the time... We, are, we, did, we did this, and it was on the Today Show the next day. Next thing I know, we're getting a call from People Magazine. I don't know if y'all saw that. It was actually a decent article, but very ominous looking, you know, very uh, gray, and uh, Auburn looks really sad and depressing, which it's not. And so anyway, the People Magazine article comes out, um, and they did a pretty decent job kind of sharing our story. And we love the, the lady who did that article. Um, she actually is still involved in our lives. She comes to see us at different places. Her name's Diane, and she is delightful. But having said that, after the People Magazine article we did, we got a call from Dr. Oz. And many of you, how many of y'all came to the Dr. Oz show? I'm just, y'all, look at all those people, Kuro and people. I loved it, but I got to tell you, um, Dr. Orloff's here, so she, she will say, yes, this happened. Y'all, we almost didn't go because that was the craziest experience, <laughs> and not in a good way. Um, the Thursday before, they're really trying to sensationalize these things. They're um, pulling er erroneous facts out. We get there, and they have these facts up on the screen, and they want us to march out, and they want us to be angry at the university, and um, they had all these, these things that were wrong that were on it, and it, it, was, it just didn't settle well. But I'll tell you that my prayer was that if one person could learn something from it, if one person can hear that they needed to get their eyes dilated, if one person could see that there were resources out there like CureOM and Melanoma Research Foundation, our page, whatever it is that could connect them to the support that they needed, I thought it would be worth it. And so sure enough, the cool part of that story was that in November, that happened in October, in November I get a call from this lady in Marietta, Georgia, who said, hey, I'm, I just wanted to call and wanted to introduce myself. I just got a dog. And I was like, Okay, it's <laughs> great. She said, no, 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 I, you, you don't understand. I just got a dog, and I was looking on a friend of mine's Facebook page who got the same kind of dog. She has a trainer, and on her Facebook page was this, this article about y'all being on the Dr. Oz show. And my husband has been talking about these symptoms he's having. He was in architecture school at the same, in the 80s when you were there. Um, he went in and had a test run, and he has ocular melanoma. Um, having plaque radiation next week. And it was like the Lord was just like, that's your, that's your one. That was the reason that this happened, so that I could get this guy in, and he's doing really well now. His name is Tony. But having said that, I go, gosh, you know, um, why, kinda, why is this all happening kind of right now? And um, let me go. Oh, I'm going backwards, sorry. So um, this is us on the Dr. Oz. And see all the um, Kuro M people in the back? I <laughs> love it. Hey, Henry, you're up there. Um, anyway, that's cute Dr. Mason on the left, and y'all see Dr. Orloff on the right, and Dr. Oz in the middle. He kind of blends in. I will say he was delightful. He was very nice. I liked him a lot. His staff, that was very interesting. But needless to say, um, I'm going to just move on and go through this very quickly because there are going to be some breakout sessions about what's going on in Auburn. But I wanted y'all to know that we have started the research efforts there. Dr. John Mason is going to be in charge. One of the things that I loved is I feel very strongly supported by the university. Some people are like, you know, what is the university doing? Well, one of the things the university did is, well, actually, this man did it. I'm going to embarrass him because he's here. Um, but the university knew that they needed to do something, but it's really an overwhelming task. And so Dr. Kim, who is the medical director um, on Auburn's campus, kind of knew the weight of this. And he came to the university and he said, let me, let me head this up. 
okay? Let me be the liaison between you guys. And what he has done has been remarkable. He has gone out to, he's met with the different people from Huntersville. He's gone to Duke. He's gone to MD Anderson. He's met with Dr. Orloff and their team and Thomas Jefferson. And not only that, but he's been an advocate for us, for the university, to go and say, when, you know, a study was done that showed this wasn't a cluster, it doesn't meet that very strict definition. And if you look back, Dr. Orloff made a video prior to them doing the study saying, we know this is not going to be a cluster. They're going to do the study. It's not going to be a cluster. It just, it's a very strict definition. So having said that, the university could have gotten that information and walked away. But Dr. Cam went to him and said, you know, the right thing to do is for us to do research, for us to, to come alongside them and see what's going on. And, and he did that. And so the university has um, offered to pay for an arm of the research, which is the geospatial analysis that's going to be done. Um, we're working very closely with Dr. Mike Brennan and, of course, I'm getting consulting from Dr. Sato and Dr. Orloff and them. Um, but anyway, we have a, a cohort of 33 people um, between 1980 and the present. Um, 30 of them, I think, have agreed to participate. We know that the cost of this is going to be about $8,000 per person, so that's a lot of money. Um, even with the university paying what they're paying, and the, we've raised about $63,000, we still have another $130,000, $140,000 in order to do this research correctly. Okay, so that's kind of a, a very quick summation of where we're going. And so I will tell you, and um, I'm almost finished, but I, I will tell you that I did sit there one day in the spring of 2018. Um, I had a lot of big life events going on. My daughter was graduating from high school. I had a new job. Um, my sister was getting married. Uh, we were moving to a new house. And just a lot of big life events. And it was very busy. Um, remember that little Facebook page of 36 people I thought I'd be communicating with is now four or 5,000 people. And the weight of that, the responsibility of that, um, did not fall lightly on me. I felt very responsible that if you emailed me or Facebook messaged me that I needed to respond to that. And I had this new job, and I remember thinking, I'm not going to let it interfere with my job. But I would come home and have hundreds of people I needed to respond to. And you can imagine how many moms reached out to me saying, what dorm did you live in? And I had the university call me saying, hey, we had three moms call us overnight that we're having to move kids out of the dorm because... Be careful what you say, you know, what you said on Dr. Oz is affecting us here, and just a lot of responsibility, and so I did. I was in church one day, and it wasn't a poor pitiful me, why me kind of question, but I did ask, you know, Lord, why us? Why now? And I felt like it was as clear as a bell. It's not that I heard something audible, but in my spirit, I felt like I heard him say, you know, perhaps, Ashley, um, you're in this position for such a time as this, and if y'all have ever followed us, we have that hashtag a lot. Um, for those of you older people, a hashtag is basically, you know, some, anyway, I won't go into all that. We have this hashtag uh, for such a time as this. And it comes from the story of Esther. And my Reader's Digest version of the story of Esther is kind of a cool one to me because even if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, um, if you're a Jew, then you'll know this story. But this is something that is still celebrated today, the story of Esther. And so my Reader's Digest version is, and y'all bear with me, um, but basically, Esther was born into a family where her parents were killed and she was adopted by her uncle Mordecai, taken into the land of Persia when the Jews were in exile. There was a king at that time who liked to have parties. I think I would have liked him, but he liked to have parties, and he had a party for three days that was this, this wild, drunken fest. And at the end of the third day, he decided he wanted to summon his beautiful wife, Queen Vashti, to come to the party. And some Bible scholars say that he summoned her in her queenly garb, which meant nothing but her crown. Well, she knew that that was not going to go well for her. And so she declined. And y'all, back then, you just didn't tell a man no, definitely not the king no. And so he basically stripped her of her queenship and kicked her out of the palace. Some time passed, he decides it's time for a new queen, so he, he gets 400 of the most beautiful virgins in the land to come in for a year and a half. Now, this is a sweet part of the story. They're pampered, they have lotion, they get the makeup, the clothes for a year and a half, and then they have this um, beauty pageant, and Esther wins, and she becomes queen of the land, okay? Well, in any good story, there's a bad guy, and the bad guy in the story is Haman, Haman was this rich aristocrat who basically um, had made an edict that if he came before you, you would have to bow down to him. And Mordecai, who was a Jew, was like, I'm not going to bow down to him. And so he hated Mordecai and hated the Jews, and he tricked the king into making this edict that it, this one day anybody could kill a Jew and not be held accountable, basically genocide of the Jewish population. And it broke Mordecai's heart. 
And so he comes to Esther, who is in the palace, and he says to her, I need you to go before the, queen, I mean, before the king. Well, y'all, you just didn't do that then. They didn't even live in the same building. If she went before the king, she could have been killed. As, and you had to, like, he had to like extend his royal scepter or invite you over or whatever. And so she was nervous about it. She didn't want to do it. And she looks at him and she says, I, I don't think it can be me. And he looks at her and he says, you know what, Esther? He said, if you remain silent, the Lord's going to raise somebody else up who is going to do this. Perhaps you were put in this position for such a time as this. And it's like she had to be reminded or even told what her purpose was, all right? Another part of the story is that um, the king was having trouble sleeping one night. And the way that, that the history is recorded back then, they would have a scribe that would write down something every single day. And they would put him on scrolls and put him in these huge baskets. And this king was having trouble sleeping, and like some of us, he would get up and read or ask one of the scribes, will you read this to me? So he asked one of the scribes to go and pull out the scroll, and then he read it to him. And in it, talked about how Mordecai had actually foiled the plan of somebody who was trying to kill the king, and the king had never done anything to honor him. And the neat part of that story is that he comes to, the king comes to Haman and he says, how can I celebrate this person? Doesn't tell him who. Haman thinks he's talking about him. Haman wants to kill Mordecai, but he has to honor him. And it's kind of a cool part of the story. The reason I want to tell you all of that is as I line these two things, two stories up parallel, it wasn't a mistake that, that Esther was born when she was born. It wasn't a mistake that her parents were killed, that she was um, taken in by Mordecai. It wasn't by chance that she lived in the land of Persia. It wasn't by chance that she was beautiful. It wasn't by chance that Vashti said no. It wasn't by chance that she won this beauty contest and became queen. None of that was by chance. It wasn't by chance that Jill and I reconciled our relationship and that Jill told me about this cancer in my eye. It wasn't by chance that we moved to Memphis. It wasn't by chance that Dave went into pharmaceuticals. It wasn't by chance that he became an oncology director. How does that happen? It wasn't by chance that we weren't at dinner with Caroline on her birthday or at a dinner with oncologists who point out the freaking cancer in my eye. None of that was by chance. It wasn't by chance that we moved back to Auburn at the time we did. It wasn't by chance that Nicole is researching everything and comes across this Facebook page and reaches out to us. And it wasn't by chance that we did CBS and Today and People and Oz. Because I believe that everybody in this room is kind of part of this movement that, it, that it's for such a time as this. Like I tell people, there's not a, no good time to have ocular melanoma, but if you're gonna have it, this is the time. Because there's a lot of really amazing things going on in terms of research, in terms of hope and encouragement about the direction this is going. And I think about that and I think sometimes though we have to be told um, what our purpose is. One of my favorite quotes is by Mark Twain, you know, and I love it because he says, the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day that you find out why you were born. And I think for me, um, I personally believe, and I, I don't shy away from sharing my faith or sharing um, kind of how I feel about this, but Ephesians 2.10 says that we were all created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. And I believe at this time that these are part of the good works, that what, what Cure OM is doing, what Melanin Research Foundation, what Dr. Sato and them, what Dr. Finger and what Dr. Patel and them and MD Anderson and all over, like if nothing else, I wish we would all work together a little bit better because it's just amazing what's going on right now. Um, and I think that our purpose is to make a difference and that we all can do that if we can just be reminded of how to kind of move forward with this. I'm laughing at me with this whole thing. But anyway, I do want to end on, recently I saw this interview with Elizabeth Smart, and I'm sure you're all thinking, what does she have to do with cancer? But she told a story that was kind of cancer-related, and I thought this was kind of cool. Y'all remember her, that she was the one that was kidnapped, of course. And her little story, she says, I'm probably always going to be remembered as the girl that was kidnapped. But her mom told her after she was rescued, she said, you know what? Those, your captors, your kidnappers, they stole nine months of your life, okay? But they, they can't steal your life moving forward. And one way that you can kind of get back at them is to be happy, to choose joy, to not let this past experience define you. And I think if we're not careful, I've heard of cancer being called the great kidnapper because it does exactly that. You know, John 10, 10 says that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what cancer does. It's like the great kidnapper. It's going to try to steal your joy, kill you physically, and keep you from all hope. But Elizabeth says, you know what, instead of that defining me, I've taken this to go to, as a movement to be able to move forward and encourage other people. And that's kind of what I want to leave people with because there are people in this room 
who you need to be here this weekend to be encouraged, and I appreciate that, but there are people in this room that the reason you're here is not a mistake. I believe the reason you're here is to encourage the other people that might be sitting at your table that need to hear your story, that need to hear that it's hard. There are days that I do cry. There are days that I'm not as strong as I am standing before you, but there are days that we can build each other up and reach out to each other with these support groups, reach out to each other, whether it's Facebook or calling. I mean, I tell people all the time, reach out to me. Um, I want you to. Sorry, as I think I'm, I'm so bad at this. That we're okay. Um, but moving forward, just my last little slide, I just want y'all to, to take this and run with it. Obviously, how do you move forward from here to be intentional? I'm sorry, Lauren, I'm just making you get your 10 million steps in. Um, be intentional. Don't let the cancer define you. Live with no regrets and choose joy. Um, I am so excited because I, I speak at a lot of different places and get to share my story. And I had this one lady that made this necklace for me that I have on tonight. That's, um, it, she likes to use things and repurpose them. And so these are spoons that she's hammered out with, um, for such a time as this on it. And she's selling them, not that I'm trying to solicit from y'all, but if you buy one on her site, she will give $10 to the research being done in Auburn. So I did put her little Facebook, so it's art, artistry by Leah that if you want one of these sweet little things, you can get it with a pearl or a cross or something with it. Um, I think that's pretty neat that she offered that for this weekend. But this is my contact information. If anybody wants to get in touch with me, this is my sweet family at my niece's wedding just two weeks ago. But um, I am one of those, I freely give out my cell phone, give out my email. Um, would love to be able to be an encouragement if I can to you, point you, I, I don't know all the answers. I, I hardly know any answers. I reach out to other people to get the answers, but I'm a good connector. So I'd love to connect you with the right people, and a lot of the right people are in this room. So anyway, thank you all for letting me share my story. I appreciate it so much.